Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, here we go again. Weapons inspectors, WMDs, and calls for intervention. The coverage of the Syria story, from up close and afar. Vietnam decrees what bloggers can and cannot write. Egypt releases some Al Jazeera journalists, but holds on to others. And a new twist on bribery in the Nigerian media. Plus, Julian Assange's election campaign embraces the mullet. That's our web video of the week. In a conflict as long and bloody as Syria's, it takes a significant development in the story to regain the global media's attention. That happened August 21st when graphic video surfaced on social media sites showing victims of chemical weapons attacks. The U.S., U.K. and French governments all blamed the Syrian military under President Bashar al-Assad. The subsequent debate in the international media, for the most part, followed that line dismissing the question of who was to blame for the atrocity and moving on to whether or not Western forces should intervene. However, with the UN chemical weapons report still pending, critics argue that the media are getting ahead of themselves, repeating the same mistakes made in the lead-up to the Iraq war, swallowing whole the narrative coming out of Washington. And then there's the geopolitical aspect of this story. Russia, China and Iran have all used their state-owned media to cast doubt over whether it was the Syrian military or the rebels that was responsible for the attack. However, it's not as though Washington, London or Paris were tuning in. Our starting point this week is Damascus. A day of horror in Syria. UN weapons inspectors are on the ground trying to determine if chemical weapons were in fact used. A disturbing headline from Washington. The White House tonight is presenting new evidence. The US officials will release their own intelligence report. Syria, when it comes to the news coverage, is a story of divisions, omissions, and agendas. Media internationally has divided into several camps. Uh, on the one hand, those who pretty much accept that Assad has perpetrated uh, this massacre with chemical weapons. And then there's a division there between those who say the West has a moral obligation to intervene. We should absolutely intervene to stop the genocide of more than 100,000 people. And those who say, despite all the horrors of what's taking place in Syria, the West really has no place to get involved. This is not our war. The press was quite irresponsible on this. And the question on the table is who's responsible? Assad would have to be extremely stupid to have done this. Nobody wants to talk about uh, what the insurgents would gain by uh, a, a provocative act such as this. They're desperate for Western aid. They want arms, they want air support, and they would gain by this. That's a serious thing to consider, but it's not in the papers. One of the things that the Obama administration has done is really dominate the news cycle. And there's a tendency to always put the breaking news first, to go with the most authoritative sources. Who are the major players and lead with what they have to say? And then only secondarily do the counterweights to that critics, the opposition party, or whatever, get mentioned. And the Obama administration has been very savvy about leading the conversation. Politicians try to use their domestic news outlets to achieve their political goals. In some cases, like Russia, Iran, and China, all of whom oppose an attack on Syria, the governments own news outlets that tend to question foreign governments more than they do their own. Over the past eight years, each of those governments has launched English language news channels. Russia's RT, Iran's Press TV, and CCTV in China were all designed to further their patron government's position on stories such as Syria in English to a global audience. In the US, presidential administrations do not own their own media. However, this White House and the Republican one that preceded it have proven that they can set the narrative whether the debate is Syria in 2013 or Iraq in 2003. On the other side of that debate, you have very politically motivated 
highly charged media outlets such as Russia Today, Press TV, which are little more in fact than um, propaganda channels for the nations that they represent. And these guys come with a very loaded message which is designed to cast dispersion over not just the issue of chemical weapons, but then if that's been established and they feel that that narrative no longer works. Exactly who was behind the attack is still hard to verify. They moved that narrative to saying it was perhaps the rebels who were responsible for it. It's no secret that we're partially funded by the Russian government. Uh, the same way it's no secret that Al Jazeera is funded by Doha. Russia and Russia Today gets far more criticism uh, than Al Jazeera per se uh, because of their connections and because of their funding. With that said, the criticism is inevitable, but it also gives us the freedom to ask questions that no one else is asking, that no one else would dare to ask. And that happens to be, of course, not in line with Washington. We then look to what's the Russian view? What's the Iranian view? All right, they, they are backers of Assad. Does that uh, discredit their view? Well, their view is, we think the insurgents did it. But what then did they do? They said, we need a UN report and we need to find out who did this and we need to abide by that judgment. That's an act of multilateralism. We should have engaged in such an act ourselves. Even though the prelude to the Iraq war occurred more than 10 years ago, the parallels with Syria are too fresh, too juicy for the media to ignore. The weapons inspectors, the WMD talk, Washington with its foot on the gas, other capitals and their media applying the brakes, saying the UN, not the US, should take the lead. However, upon closer inspection, the differences between Syria and Iraq outweigh the similarities, largely because in the intervening decade, the media landscape has been reshaped. Politicians can largely step back from Syria because of the level of citizen journalism coming out of that country. In fact, many people watching this show, I think, as well, will have seen the YouTube videos uploaded shortly after the chemical attack. That caused the initial condemnation around the world. So I think, in many respects, the politicians are stepping back and just letting the sheer footage from Syria and what it depicts speak for itself. Syria is really not like Iraq. There are there's some similarities, but there are also significant differences that I think are hidden when someone picks up a headline or sees a tweet, Syria, another Iraq. It's tempting today, particularly in an era of very short messages, to quickly get to the breaking news. And the journalists often want to give a little bit of context, but you don't have a lot of time for context. You don't have a lot of characters for context. So you sort of fake the context by making a historical analogy. Syria really highlights how one country and one story can be told so many different ways. And depending on who can tell it more and get across to more people, that's the story that will be written in the history books. And that's scary because it's clearly not that black and white. And certainly, at least, the people that I talk to back in the States, they have a very one-sided understanding of what's happening, not only in Syria, but in the Middle East, and that just happens to be the exact side that Washington has taken. We've got more on Syria coming up in the second half, but first, our global village voices on the coverage of the story. The media is pushing one angle, which is beating the war drums and uh, justifying as much as they can the U.S. getting involved as, in the role as the world's police. But uh, there's very little discussion about the risks of getting involved in such a war. What are the risks and what are the costs? Um, I've seen uh, really none of that analysis, just a lot of flag waving and jingoism. The debate in the Western media seems to be all about how to punish President Assad, rather than actually to see who used chemical weapons. It's like a policeman coming across a crime and deciding to charge somebody he doesn't like, rather than investigate what actually occurred. But we don't expect this from journalists in a free society. Where is the conversation about diplomatic alternatives to military force? Why aren't we talking about distributing protective gear and the remedies for chemical attacks to the Syrian people? Why isn't the media asking our leaders this, these questions? Isn't that their job? We're always looking for new faces for the program. If you'd like to share your thoughts on the news media as one of our Global Village Voices, just get in touch with us on Facebook or send us a tweet. Our Twitter handle is at AJ Listening Post. And don't forget our free video podcast on iTunes. Just look for the Listening Post, Al Jazeera English, 
and you'll find us there. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. Vietnam is widening its crackdown on bloggers and web-based political activists through a new social media law that effectively bans internet users from sharing content deemed by the government to be dangerous. The law is called Decree 72. It came into effect September 1st. Under the decree, social media users must limit what they post on sites such as Facebook and Twitter to personal information only. No quotes or links to news websites or even to state-run media are allowed. Officials say the ban is to stop the spread of content which is quote-unquote harmful to national security and to protect intellectual property and copyright. However, freedom of information campaigners fear that the law is so vaguely worded that critical voices will be silenced in Vietnam as and when the government sees fit. The deputy director for Human Rights Watch in Asia, Phil Robertson, said the decree has been established for selective persecution. This is a law that will be used against certain people who have become a thorn in the side of the authorities in Hanoi. The new law follows a rash of detentions of Vietnamese citizen journalists. 46 bloggers or activists have been sentenced to jail so far this year, which already surpasses the number for all of 2012. Egypt has released a team of Al Jazeera journalists that was in Cairo to cover the protests following the fall of President Mohamed Morsi. The team consisted of Al Jazeera English correspondent Wayne Hay, cameraman Adil Bradlow, and producers Russ Finn and Mohamed Bahir. They were released September 1st after being held five days without charges. Hay, Bradlow and Finn were deported to London that same day. Meanwhile, on August 29th, the authorities in Egypt formally banned Al Jazeera's Egyptian outlet, Mubashir Misra, accusing the channel of threatening national security. Mubashir Misra was one of nine TV channels shut down in early July by the new government, following the coup that toppled Morsi. The channel then started to broadcast directly from Al Jazeera's home base in Qatar. The subsequent official ban on Mubashir came just days after Al Jazeera Arabic, the pan-Arab news channel, broadcast calls by supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood for demonstrations against the new government. Two Al Jazeera staff remain in Egyptian custody. Mubashir Misra cameraman Mohamed Badr has been held for more than a month, and Al Jazeera Arabic correspondent Abdullah al-Shami was arrested August 14th. According to the Paris-based press freedom activists at Reporters Without Borders, a total of 80 journalists have been arrested in Egypt since the coup. Five have been killed in the violence post-coup, with dozens more attacked by police and protesters. A reporter in Nigeria has been caught using the cachet of the global media to fool corrupt politicians into paying him thousands of dollars in bribes. Paul Yempe, a reporter for a local radio station, was traveling in the oil-rich state of Bayelsa in August, posing as a reporter for CNN covering the ongoing oil strikes there. Reports suggest that a number of state officials desperate for favorable coverage paid Yempe cash to boost their profile in a documentary that he said he was working on. It's common for Nigerian journalists, most of whom are poorly paid, to take bribes from officials in exchange for good coverage or for criticism of their rivals. Yempe's scam just put a new twist on that. The reporter turned con man got busted when the head of a local journalist's union happened to be at the office of a state energy official that Yempe was visiting. War reporting used to be pretty straightforward. Get yourself into the conflict zone to bear witness to events on the ground, deal with the propaganda, the inevitable fog of war, and then try to tell the story. However, in Syria today, some of the most detailed information is coming from sources who spend their time not dodging bullets on the battlefield, but setting up Skype calls and trawling through myriad videos on the web. These news sources do the bulk of their work online, and they often have no previous experience in journalism or conflict analysis. But as budgets shrink and the Syrian war becomes ever more dangerous to cover, many of the leading lights in the news world, on the air and in print, are getting their information from these independent and unconventional sources. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on the key online players in the coverage of Syria, some of whom have never set foot in the country they're covering. This is one of the go-to websites for news on Syria. It's followed by journalists, human rights groups, even weapons experts. It's a geek's guide to the conflict, and the blogger behind it is nowhere near Damascus. He's from Middle England, suburban Leicester. His real name is Elliot Higgins. His online moniker, Brown Moses. I used to be one of these people who used to debate and discuss stuff online a lot, you know, for years and years, and I was always very interested in current events. Um, so when the 
events of the Arab Spring came along, I was very interested in what was coming through social media in particular. And one thing I noticed was there was a lot of stuff being overlooked and, you know, there might be just little snippets of information, but they would build a picture. And one of the reasons I started the blog was to start making, sort of recording that information. It really defies uh, one's intelligence to think that a young unemployed person who um, takes his name um, from a, from a pop song and who has no formal training in any of this becomes such an important source of information. Brown Moses is quite an extraordinary character. When I was inside Syria, there was um, a particular rocket launch that I came across that was really unusual. It looked Chinese made. I'd got a picture of that and I got it to Brown Moses to say, what the hell is this thing? Got an email straight back, he knew exactly who had the patent, where that was made, how common it was, and it was particularly, you know, particularly common in the area that I was in. He is just one of those people who has got an incredible amount of knowledge at his fingertips. One thing I did very early on was look at the weapons being used in the conflict because no one had actually written about that at that point. But because there were so many videos coming out, you could clearly see the sort of weapons being used. I had no idea it would, you know, take off like it has. Elliot Higgins isn't the only unexpected, untrained chronicler of the war in Syria. There's the Damascus-based Sham News Network, the UK-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, and the local coordination committees, or LCCs, dotted all over Syria. These outlets have become go-to sources for information on a story that has confounded global media. How do you report a war that, along with more than 100,000 deaths, has claimed the lives of 50-plus journalists, where 37 journalists have been kidnapped, and where the government is conducting a campaign against media outlets it doesn't agree with? I think the Syria conflict has taught us the limitations of mainstream media today. Unconventional news outlets like the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights and the Sham News Network have become the dominant source of information and content coming out of Syria. If they didn't exist, it would just be an information blackout. By and large, if you look at Reuters, AP, the Western Wire Services, they rely very heavily on the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights and the LCCs. It's surprisingly easy to get hold of um, activists either on Skype or sometimes on a sort of dodgy uh, landline connection. We found that actually most towns, the large towns, even small towns, even villages sometimes, there'll be a local coordination committee like an LCC. So you'd say, look, I really want to speak to the uh, media representative from the LCC in Homs. And you'll immediately be given their name. They'll probably be online. you will be speaking to them. Look closely at the coverage of any story coming out of Syria. Often the sources being name-checked are recent entrants to the news business. In May 2012, images of civilians killed in Hula came via the Sham News Network. The group says it's based in Damascus and it uploads huge amounts of material from around the country onto the web. In March this year, Elliot Higgins broke news about Croatian weapons being used by rebels in Daraa, in southern Syria. His blog post sparked a New York Times investigation. And on one of the most contentious issues, casualty figures, one outlet is frequently quoted, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights has emerged as one of the main sources for information for mainstream media. It started providing information as soon as the uprising in Syria started about um, things like the number of dead, um, the number of casualties, who got wounded, where battles are, if there were explosions, where they were, um, eyewitness accounts, things of that sort. And I think the strength of the uh, observatory is that um, it has many informants on the ground. Um, it claimed at some point that it had 200 informants. The disadvantage, of course, is that most of these informants will, by definition, tend to be in favor of the opposition and against the regime in Syria, which might give their reporting of event a certain slant. All that influences um, how credible the information is. By their own admission, the Syrian Observatory has been backed by EU funders, uh, EU countries, but that has led to some criticism by those who say, that European funding means they're biased. It means that they're you know, taking some sort of anti-regime position. How reliable is it? I think with Syria, we've come to understand and see the world in degrees of confidence. The Syrian Observatory has been relied upon 
by the Western media, criticized by the regime media. Um, it is a controversial news source, and there's no way to really verify any one piece of information on the Syrian Observatory's website. We, we cannot confirm what's happened. We have footage that we will show you, but we cannot verify what's happened. But the fact that they've become uh, sort of semi-official news outlet for the opposition has given them some credibility and something of a brand to protect. With the recent chemical weapons attack and the looming specter of a US-led intervention, reporting on the war in Syria is growing more dangerous. And it's always been an expensive story to cover. Add it all up, and news organizations are likely to grow more reliant on little-known new media outlets and news reports that are unconventionally sourced. These guys are able to do things which they're not able to do. I also suspect there's been such massive cuts in, in, in mainstream media that a lot of them might be very reliant on people like Brown Moses and these groups. You know, it's very expensive and it's very dangerous to send journalists in and a lot of people actually haven't got the money to do that and don't really feel that it's warranted uh, if you've got all these other sources coming out. When you're a journalist on the ground, you know, a funny looking rocket launcher might not mean anything, but from my position I can see it relates, you know, could be a Croatian smuggling ring or something like that. Because I watch, you know, as many videos as possible, I can see a video and I think, you know, I recognise something from six months ago that relates to that video and I can go back there and I can sort of build a picture. Unconventional sources um, and, and on the Syrian story are a challenge to uh, um, the mainstream media and at the same time they're vital. They do provide information that the mainstream media cannot, but at the same time there will always be a cloud of suspicion. So they cannot live with them, but they cannot live without them. More Global Village voices now on the unconventional sources covering the Syria story. Each and every single day, hundreds or thousands of YouTube videos and eyewitness reports are uploaded by Syrian citizen journalists. However, all of this information was completely unverified using both technology to verify videos. Through all this, we've determined that using these techniques, we can verify these reports and form a more complete and holistic picture of what's going on in the ground in Syria. The citizen journalism is very important everywhere, not just in Syria because it's the only way to double or to triple check uh, the news. There is no difference between the official sources and the unconventional sources in the news industry. Both they will try to manipulate, to control the information. When they want to help, they will help. When they want to mislead, they will do so. It is only up to you to create an alternative way to check the information and to keep your reliability. Finally, he's been holed up at the Ecuadorian embassy in London for more than a year now, but that is not stopping WikiLeaks co-founder Julian Assange from running for a seat in the Australian Senate this week. And to help his cause, he's come up with a WikiLeaks-inspired tribute video wearing a mullet wig and singing a song from the 80s, You're the Voice, that many of us would probably rather forget. The team at Juice Rap News is based in Oz. They produce a satirical internet newscast where anchormen rap their way through the headlines. They shot the piece with Assange, and after the video made the rounds on the internet, Ecuador's president, Rafael Correa, who has offered Assange political asylum, sent him a letter asking Assange to stop ridiculing Australian politicians. Still, we've made this our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. I'm told there might be another challenger. We crossed to correspondent Ken Ocan. Ken, you with me? Ken Ocan, I'm in London at the Ecuadorian Embassy. We hear that this year there's to be another contender seeking a Senate seat. That's right, I'm sent to speak with a fella called, um, called... Julian Assange. Sam, mate. Julian Assange. He's running for the Senate in these electoral races. I like him. He keeps saying coverage is cut. Something contagious. Outrageous. But, mate, with this whole look you got going on, you got Buckley's hope of getting voted from all the Sheilas and blokes back home in Oz, but what you need is a makeover. Strew, this came out even better than I'd hoped. I'm feeling it. Are you feeling it? Bloody oath. Now you're ready to go hard in Australian politics. What message do you want to say to the populace? We have a chance to turn the pages over. We can write what we want to write. We gotta make things leak. So we can get much bolder Ooh, We're all wired, tapped now We're all being fed 